there's been uh, quite a bit of uh, talk about the last weekend in July as a recruiting weekend. You know, DB said if he th- he thinks that if, if they can get David Sanders back on campus that weekend, that um, he thinks there's a real shot there. We heard Garrett McGuire talk about that last weekend in July on Sports Nightly last night. Talk to me for for the lay people who maybe don't follow the days in, day in and day out of recruiting the way some of us do. Like, why is the the why is this last weekend in July shaping up to be so important? Um. I, I mean, I, it sounds like they're going to get some really good names in to Lincoln. We're still confirming some of them, like a, a few that people know for sure. Like there's a couple, you know, California kids that are, you know, four-star prospects and 26 and then a 27 one who's going to be who are coming in. Um, so I think that, that shows you like there's a wide range on this net to where people are coming from, like Hudson Parliament who has one of the best names Incredible. of uh, any recruit Incredible. Um, who you want to land just for that alone, probably um, is one of the guys coming in. And then, like you say, there is buzz about like, you know, Sanders, maybe the possibility to get him here. And um, if you do that, I mean, obviously it speaks to his level of intrigue that he would, would return one more time. Uh, but, you know, every time I feel like they get people, in their building around their coaching staff and can show, Hey, this is the family part again. Don't forget how much of a family it is over here. It always plays really well for Nebraska. So that list will get more firmed up here in the next week. I don't want to talk out of turn too much with some guys. while I know a little bit's up in the air, but it does seem like stuff is really brewing for one, like last big push that kind of uh, puts you in a good space with not just like a, a 25 guy but 26 27 guys for the future so you're you're already kind of off and running then as you go through the fall with some of the guys a cycle or two ahead which is always critical nowadays bc with the, i guess from like and and i i understand you don't want to name any names and that you're not sure on and that's that's totally fine but i guess just like philosophically why is it shaping up this way is it just that guys now are more um, kind of looking to make decisions before their senior year starts or, or just from a, like, is it just a scheduling thing that it works, that's worked out this way? It's a good scheduling day for a lot of guys before like their, their camp stuff gets going. It's mm. sort of that in between period. Um, you know, a lot of 26, 27 guys, um, who are cycled two or two ahead are just starting to dance a little bit. Right. I mean, they, they, so this is an opportunity maybe to get that first experience for a few of them of like a, a visit like that. But I just think it's kind of that perfect wheelhouse of, if you know, you're, you're looking at a date where prospects, they're kind of all camped out, but there's like this little mini period before maybe their high school stuff has started up, you know, day to day and, uh, you can get them here. And so, why not? It's it's a good weekend to shoot your shot with some of those guys. BC, there was a little bit of uh, shifting in Nebraska's current commits uh, in their rankings over the, I think it was last week when, when you guys released your, your ratings update. I know that you personally do not <laughs> make the ratings, but I guess how much insight do you have on, you know, like, Sean Hammerbeck, for instance, goes from a three-star to a four-star. TJ Latif drops from a four-star to a three-star. Like, I guess how much insight do you have on kind of why these decisions are made? Is it based on – because it to me, I look at it, I go, okay, well, I don't know how much has changed. Like, what new information did we learn about these guys? Yeah, I mean, usually when a guy gets changed, um, it's because we've had – different guys who are like the scouts in our service who do who go to the camps and all that um who have watched them several times they've it's not just one person's decision it's uh usually you know there's there's various insights into it and they're like you know this guy's not not high enough they're, they're they've seen it with their own eyes they've heard it from other people and sometimes they think somebody's a little high i think in latif's case you know um it's not, I don't think it's a big alarm, but you know, maybe just didn't have his best elite 11 compared to some other guys. And that's, that might be the, I think that's probably the start and end of it. And, um, you know, to that, I would say it's, it's one camp. I would, he, there's plenty of time for him to continue to show himself as a really good prospect, which he is. So I think that's maybe why he lost a little bit. Um, and then Hammerbeck is just, he's kind of a nice surprise because he's in that area where, 
sometimes in recruiting rankings, a guy like him could fall through the cracks if we're honest. Mm-hmm. And uh, he didn't. You know, he's obviously when he's gone to camps, he's impressed everybody everywhere he's went. Uh, very versatile lineman who he's got the strength, yes, but he's also got uh, incredible mobility for that size. And I think people just paired it all together in the measurables and said that that's going to be a dude. So Nebraska was in on that before he was a four star. Um, and you know, they, they liked, they liked all the same things. Our, our guys, who did the ratings like, so I, I wasn't surprised that he got that. Um, but it was well-deserved. I'll say that. So you don't just have like one guy sitting in a room that as soon as Colorado offers a kid, knocks him down a whole star rating. <laughs> I don't believe it works like that. No, <laughs> um, but, uh, I know there, I know people like to, to throw that out there that that's how it happened. Um, I have never had, uh, as you say, a part in the ratings. So um, once in a while, there will be a prospect where we'll we'll throw our two cents in. You know, mm-hmm. we'll be like, you, you might take another look at this guy, see see what you guys think about him. And that happens certainly on occasion. But um, a lot of that's out of our hands, which always makes it fun, of course, if a guy gets dropped and you got to answer questions for it when you're like, ah, yeah, I didn't do that. So, but. Um, <laughs> So it goes it. That's just one of the part, fun parts of the job. So, BC, I, I am curious, though, because I, I know I make the joke about Colorado, but it does seem like more on the positive side than the negative side, usually, where it's like, okay, a guy, and I think Coach Rules talked about this a little bit, like a guy picks up an Ohio State offer or he picks up mm-hmm. a Georgia or Alabama offer. That does seem like, does that get kind of baked into like, oh, if these programs are all kind of sniffing at the door like maybe we need to take another look at what this guy's rated you know um i can't speak for those guys how much of that they do or don't do mm, but okay. um you know i mean we're we're human i'm sure if like uh, the the eight to ten top programs in the country are all looking at the same person usually first off that guy's been on somebody's radar that's, that's doing the ratings for sure. a while anyway because yeah. he's, he's usually those type of prospects don't just come out of it anywhere um so I don't know, though. I don't want to speak out of turn for those guys and how they do the process because there, there's stuff I don't know about that, that you know, when, when they put it together. So I don't want to be unfair to them. For sure. That's Brian Christoph from Husker 24-7. Um, so, BC, as you're um, kind of listening to Garrett McGuire last night and, and him talk about some things there, one of the things that caught me kind of – I don't know if by surprise, but I, he he had some very strong praise for Jamal Banks and even mm-hmm. calling him a quarterback's best friend. W- were you surprised at how, I guess, strongly he he kind of went out there and, and stood on a limb for Jamal Banks? No, Jamal Banks is huge for this, this team. And uh, the first part is his skill set uh, because he, he's – got that frame now where if you're in the red zone you feel like you can put it up for him and and there's a better chance he's going to go get it than the other guy um he's got sort of that box out ability you know just like to i think frame up a db and at third down and five you're you're, you you get your eight yards and he's got the better positioning um so he can bring that to the table i think what that also does is it's going to open up more of the field for other guys if you can get people like uh, Banks and Fedoni sort of work in that middle um, or some of that like intermediate part of the passing game. Um, think about what it does uh, for like Jalen Lloyd or, or Malachi or, or, you know, Isaiah Nayor, I think the guy can fly a little bit too. So he's, he's got all the stuff you want. He's got the proven resume because he's had two seasons back to back at Wake Forest where he had 650 yards plus. And if you look within in those numbers, like he, against Clemson, he had a game where he had about 150 yards one of those years. So, I mean, he, he's done it against good competition, too, the top top type of teams and great athletes. So there's a lot to love. And then the fact that he's just a guy who came in right away and is mature and says, I'm, I'm part of the fabric of this thing. You know, like I, I'm going to be right in, in it. I'm going to be a leader. Um, and he's, he's been that from day one, from every uh, – you know, interview that we've done about him. And uh, also, I think he's got a good connection with Dylan Riola. Let's not forget that when he visited in December before he made his final choice, Dylan threw with him. And um, that was a big deal because he saw that, okay, this 
he's 18, but he's got some tools that not many 18 year olds have. And I think it made a big impression on Banks. And surely that relationship has grown since then. BC just spoke with Jamal Banks on Sunday and loved every single word that he said. Just very charismatic and, and very mature, well spoken yeah. man. Um, but you don't have to say Jamal Banks because I'm asking this question, but who do you think will be the most impactful transfer this upcoming fall? Ooh. Um, I mean, Banks is a certainly a good answer. He was the highest of the transfers we had on our indispensable list. But um, I think I think Nair is going to be right there with them. Um, I think it could, you could answer either of those guys um, because I, Isaiah Nair's um, – I, I I feel like if you look back at his resume in 2021 when he was I know a few years ago with Wyoming he's averaging like almost 20 yards per catch and even in the spring game he had that one it's just one play I know but he, he took that crossing route and you saw that he's one of those dudes who just has like that extra gear where he, you think he's going one speed the DB thinks he's taking the angle and has him and then no he's going another speed actually all of a sudden and he, he was gone. There was a flag on the play, so it didn't go in the stats and all that, but our eyes saw it. We mm-hmm. all saw it. We're like, okay, that's nice. And I just love that combination of those two guys. Like, you, you couldn't have drawn it up much better as far as, like, okay, we kind of like how our young guys are developing in this room, but what are, like, the two parts we could add that really make this thing take off and are a bridge to the future? You got a big, sturdy guy in Banks, and Nair, Nair's not small either. Don't get me wrong. That guy, like, when he came to the podium, you're like, oh, that's how they're supposed to look. Uh, but he's got maybe that that speed component to a little bit more. It's just a nice, nice combo. The interesting wild card to me is going to be Mazuka to your question, Anna, mm. um, on the O line. Um, you know, obviously people remember right away he was one of the guys who sort of rule mentioned out loud. Like you got to fit, you know, you got to see how we're doing things here and kind of fit into that. And so he's had to maybe catch up with that. But you look at what he's done. I mean, he he had really high PFF grades at Florida last year. Obviously played at Baylor before that. That's a guy who's played a ton of football. Also looks like a next-level player when you just see him in person. And so that's interesting, though, because Justin Evans is at a great offseason. Latofsky's at a really good offseason. Uh, Corcoran, of course, is kind of floating at some spot, you know, that could be in the rotation. Um, there's going to be a good player or two on that old line who's not starting. And so that's going to be really interesting to watch this camp. BC, if you had to say today, who do you think is the starting offensive line? I guess I'd say Mizuka is going to get in there. Although I, I'm less like writing that in pen than everybody else. And maybe I'm stupid about it, but I go, I'm going by what we saw in the spring. And I kept listening and hearing how they talk about Latoski and Evans, but I would say, uh, Prohaska left tackle, um, Oh, let's see. I guess Mazuka, uh, Scott, I think Evans and um, Bryce. Mm. I mean, maybe that those five, but there there could be one that's off there. Honestly, uh, Latovsky's in that mix, and um, you know where they put Corcoran is like I, I don't think Corcoran's going to be in the front five, but he's an interesting guy because he's played as much football as anybody, and he's he's back. So um, there's some. There's some good battles to be had this camp still, or where they want to, or which side they want to put certain guys to is an interesting part of it. BC, speaking of battles, one name you didn't mention, Dante Dowdell. How do you think he fits into this running back room? Is it out of the question for him to be that RB one? Well, you never know. Um, just and I say you never know because I mean, let's go back a year ago. Um, you know, Emmett Johnson was obviously there were injuries that impacted this, but he was fourth or fifth. Not if, if we had had this conversation 365 days ago, and I'd said Emmett Johnson's going to like start for two months, you would have said like, "Don't have." You probably say this a lot of weeks anyway, like, "Don't have this guy on the radio anymore." But <laughs> you definitely would have said that. Um, I think it could be tough for one of those younger guys to emerge to the front right away, because I think Emmett. And Ramirez and Gabe, we'll, we'll see how Gabe comes back fully from his injury as far as the football stuff. He, he was doing team activities in the summer. All those guys um, obviously have the experience advantage, and so I kind of put those three above everybody else. I'm putting Emmett at the top of the line until proven otherwise. Like I feel like he earned that last year. Um, it's going to be a good competition. You're going to need three guys. 
But it's a good question you ask because somebody like Dowdell is probably going to be part of it at some point in the year. You know what I mean? Like there's going to be a point where you need a, a another back, even if he starts as like the fourth or fifth guy to maybe give you something. And, you know, Quinton Ives is somebody that we haven't seen a lot about, but, you know, this coaching staff still says we believe in him. So um, you, that's one of those positions where even if you're a guy that's sort of off the map right now, uh, maybe things are different by August 20. 20- 20th, you know, when we're talking about it. We'll see. BC, if Bly Hill hadn't gotten injured, would we be talking more about him in this conversation as well? Yeah, absolutely. And 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 honestly, to Anna's question earlier, um, he would be a fine answer, you know, because uh, as far as the best transfer, because mm-hmm. he was, I think, in line to start with uh, Tommy Hill coming out of the spring on the opposite side. And so... He's not out for the season. It's just a matter of it's going to be a test for a guy who, first off, he hasn't played at this level. You know, he's from St. Francis, PA, so this is a big step up. Mm -hmm. Secondly, he's got a weird timing deal now where, like, when he gets healthy, you're going to probably miss all camp, and you're going to have to kind of come back just, like, right in the middle of it when guys already have, you know, have played three or four games. That's, that's not easy to do for like a veteran, let alone a, someone who's new to this level of football. So that's the only thing about this current season. But if you want to talk long term as far as best transfer ads, um, he's up there. Sire Wright might prove that he's up there, you know, like uh, as far as the, the transfer from USC and, and coming in late, like maybe he, he earns a job right away. So um, the, all those guys who they brought in from the portal, when you go through them, um, they can be heard from this season, and so that's obviously what you want out of that. Nebraska is not going into there just to get guys that uh, you know sit around for a year or two. They're they're looking for difference makers right away. Brian, what do you do with a guy like Sire Wright? Like I, I don't I don't really know what to do with him. In, in you know he didn't obviously didn't play last year really. Uh, like I, I don't know what to do with him as a transfer. Like I, I understand there's there's some promise there and that kind of thing, but yeah. I'm just not really sure how to process him being on the team. Yeah, I don't know either yet. You got to just see, you got to roll the ball out there and see what happens, you know, in camp. And um, there's a lot of really interesting young guys um, in that secondary. And at least a couple of them who are first or second year players, um, I feel like have to be heard from, you know, like Jeremiah Charles, we all know what an athletic freak he is. Like, is this where you start to to hear his name or he pops up right away? Uh, I don't discount the really high IQ guys that are true freshmen from at least appearing on the two deep or on the fringe of the two deep. You you know, I know Caleb's doing really good stuff. and I'm not saying that because Damon's always on here. I mean, (laughs) I I, I know I know Caleb has jumped right in and is putting up good numbers. So uh, I think there's there's if I'm a young defensive back or a newcomer over there, I love the situation because it's it's open to at least compete and put myself there. Like, that's all you can ask for. So maybe it's a guy like Sire, right? But maybe it's uh, someone who's been in the system a year or two, and now it's their turn like Jeremiah Charles to rip it, rip it off and, and be a main guy. Is the secondary the place that you've got the most unanswered questions on who actually is going to get playing time back there? Uh, just at the one spot, um, I'm I'm curious about the one corner for sure, and then sort of like, who's the next wave behind all those vets we talk about all the time? Like, I mean, you've got they can flip Hartzog to a corner if they wanted, uh, but he was playing safety in the spring actually. Mm-hmm. Uh, you know, Singleton and you know, Buford is going to be really tough to keep off the field. I don't think you will. Mm -hmm. Gifford's obviously going to play a lot in Tommy Hill. So you've got like that nice base of like five guys there. And then it's to me like, okay, who's like kind of six through 10 this year. That's, that's really interesting. Or maybe five through 10, I could say. So, um, there are, there is, if you're, if the question though is going into the season, what is one concern spot you have in a defense that we all think is going to be pretty good? Um, it's the one corner spot. And the reason I say that is it is going to have to be somebody that's a newer face and they might be up for the job from week one, but we can't 
we can't play dumb here. I mean, Colorado, say what you want about their program or this or that. They've got some skilled dudes who are going to test you in a primetime game, and you're going to have to have a, a guy with some metal that's at one of those corner spots uh, who's ready to step up to that moment. So that's going to be a real early test for a specific spot on this roster to show uh, they're ready to roll, uh, and we're going to know some things uh, already by September 7th. It's Brian Christopherson, Husker 24-7. BC, we appreciate it. As always, we'll talk to you next week. Yeah, thanks for having me, guys.